If you need notes, you can just raise your hand and the ushers will give you notes. Or if you want to download it, you know, it's like QR code, um, you can download that. So just hold up your hands and say, get the notes. I just want to talk about that, um, that song for a little bit because some people might be going, I am Hepzibah. <laughs> what is that? What is that talking about? How many of you are wondering what Hepzibah means? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <coughs> the word Hepzibah is actually out of Isaiah 62. And it's in context of the Lord talking to Israel. And the Lord calls her Hepzibah. And what the word Hepzibah means is my delight is in you. So this is the word that the father comes to Israel. And what we have to realize in the context of Isaiah 62 is that Israel was broken. She had turned away from God. She had run after idols. She had um, made the temple unholy. She had given sacrifices to God when he required. She, she brought him the second, like not even the second best. And she, she really had, had looked at him in the face and said, I don't want you. And in that place of Israel's brokenness, in her place of her uncleanness, in her self-righteousness, the father comes to Israel and he says, I know what you're saying, but I want you to hear what I'm saying. And what I say over Israel is my delight is in you. And there's this passage. I'm going to read just a little bit of Isaiah 62 because I believe this is, this is what the father is speaking over his bride in America right now. We have all these other voices in our society. We have all the other sounds and the noises from media, from newscasters, from the, your phones, and all this access to so much words and voices that we miss the still small voice of the Father. And he speaks over his bride in America, and he goes, Hepzibah, my delight is in you. And because it's such a still small voice, we don't hear it, so we keep running after other delights. And he's there going, no, I call you. No, I call you Hepzibah. In Isaiah 62, I mean, this is, this is the heart of the Father. He goes, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. He says, you will be called by a new name. Receive this. This is what the Father is speaking over us tonight. You will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. And the importance here of the mouth of the Lord, how did the Lord create the earth? He spoke. He spoke and it was. When the mouth of the Lord speaks a new name over you, His word is creator. When he, you, by faith, receive what he speaks over you, it changes. Everything changes with just one word that the Lord speaks. He says, you will be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. And it will no longer be said to you, forsaken. He says, there's a generation, and he's a generation, it'll no longer be said over you, forsaken, rejected, not wanted, cast to the side. The father says, I have a name for this generation, and I call you Hepzibah. You're my delight, generation, where the world and the enemy, the devil has lied to you. And he's told you false identities. He made you. I mean, this, the enemy has made us nothing better than animals. We've been indoctrinated since little kids in a public school system that teaches evolution and says you're no better than an ape. 
And he said, when your identity becomes animalistic, all things are possible then. The enemy jerks you around and he gives you identity. And the father goes, oh, no. I have a name for a generation. And I say, you're my delight. You're my delight. And as soon as the, word, the Lord speaks, this is, this is, we have to be so clear on this. That which the Lord loves, the enemy hates. That which the Lord loves, the enemy hates. So when the Lord looks at a generation with endearment in his heart, and he speaks over you, oh, my delight is in you. Guess what that does to the enemy? It inhumanizes. Because the thing the enemy wants most is to get to God. And he goes, and how can I get to God? And he goes, I'll destroy that which is precious to him. So you're in a battle. You're not neutral. You have a heavenly father speaking, my delight is in you. That causes the rage of the enemy to rile up because all he wants is to get even with God. And so he rages against his beloved ones. He rages against your generation in all means, in all ways. That which the Lord loves, the enemy hates. So if you want to know why, why all this stuff, why all that? Because he has a lot of delight in you. And the enemy's going to do everything he can to steal that. But as the t-shirts say, and as we heard, when the Son of Man is glorified, the victory of the bride is prophesied. And what we're going to hear tonight is that he, the devil, cannot overcome. The devil cannot overcome the voice of the Lord over a generation. The devil cannot thwart the plans that the Father has set since the day of creation. So let's go into our notes. It says, the Father's desire from the beginning. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis. And we're going to look at a father that wasn't haphazard in creation. We are, we're talking about God who has all wisdom. Our kids on the way here, were, they were kind of talking about, well, like, why does everybody listen to the Tesla owner? And the other one, well, because he's so brilliant. And they're talking back and forth. And he's, he's so smart. He makes all this money. He's brilliant. But you know what? He's only a man. As brilliant as that man is, he's only a man. And all that that brilliance shows is that there's a God that's more brilliant. (laughs) Right? And so here we have a father who had a plan. And his desire was for a family. There's the Holy Spirit. There's the son and there's the father. And the father goes, I want a family. I want a family. Because I want many sons and daughters. And he created Man with the intention of being a father. With the intention of being a father. To the animals, he is God Almighty, the creator. But to man, he goes, oh, I'll be a father. And they can be sons and daughters to me. This is, this is the, the um, motivation of creation of man. Here it says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoptions as sons. It says the spirit himself testifies that we're what? Children of God. And if children, heirs. So now we have a father who wants sons and daughters, and he wants to give them an inheritance. So the father is in heaven. who He has something. He has an inheritance that he's going... Who can I give this inheritance to? Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. This is the father's like, it's like all of a sudden he's going, oh, let us make man. Let us, let me have sons and daughters that I can give an inheritance to. So from the very beginning, we see a father who wants to give. A father who's generous and wants to give. In 2 Corinthians it says, And I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. 
And so in this second passion of the father's heart, he's also longing for a bride for his son. He wants a bride for his son. In Isaiah, it says, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Did you, so let's break that down a little bit. Before the foundation of the world, when was the foundation of the world? Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said before Genesis 1, there was a lamb who was slain. And who is the lamb that was slain? Jesus. And last night we heard that he's the son of man. So before the foundation of the world, before there was even a earth and trees and plants, there was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And the father said, I want a reward for my son's sacrifice. I want to give him something. So he says to his son, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Genesis 2, 18, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. We're talking about Adam. He sees Adam. The father goes, it's not good for this man to be alone, so I'll make him a, a helper suitable for him. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So let's jump over to Ephesians, and let's see what's in the father's heart. When the father is looking at Adam in the garden, and he's up there, he just creates man. He goes, oh, Adam, you're my son. And Adam, I created you for my son. And he looks at Adam and he goes, Adam, it's not good that you're alone. So I'm going to create a helper suitable for you. So God creates Eve. And he brings Eve to Adam. And he makes a declaration over them and says, you shall leave your father and your mother and the two will become one. But let's think, Adam has no father and mother. Right? Right? Are we brilliant in here, right? We're all brilliant, right? Yeah. Adam has no father and mother. What is the father talking about? If you go to Ephesians 5, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reverence to Christ. Mystery isn't great that Adam and Eve are going to start this thing called marriage and the two will be one. No, the mystery that's so great is that there's a bride for my son and the two shall become one. This is the great mystery. When the father looked at Adam and said it's not good for the man to be alone, there was a lamb that was already slain in heaven, the son of man. Out of Daniel 7. And the father looked at his son in heaven and said, It's not good that my son should be alone in his humanity, in his man. Oh, God the Father is spirit. And there's the Holy Spirit. And there's a communion. But the father inside is going, There's something about my son. And it's not good that he should be alone. And I will create a helper suitable for him. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Did you know we are created? It's not so much that Jesus was like, oh, i got to somehow become like man now to come down to earth. God's like, no, I'm going to create us according to his image that Jesus can embody. We are created according to his likeness. Jesus didn't get created or didn't come into our likeness. God, the Father goes, I know my son and whom a body in which he can dwell in. And therefore, here's man. Here's man. We did not evolve. And the reason why this is so important I want you to hear me because in our, in our Christian, oh, yeah, we know we didn't evolve. We came from Adam. No, 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 no. You did not evolve. You were created 
in the image of God. Every one of us. And being created in the image of God means we are like him. That means we can actually have fellowship with God. No animal can have fellowship with God. No animal can have communion. No animal can come into covenant with God. No animal can experience God. The father goes, it is not good that my son should be alone. He needs someone that can relate to him. So therefore, I'll create man according to our image. I will create him, male and female. He created him so that Jesus would be in heaven and go, I can share my heart with someone. There's someone that can understand me. There's someone that I can talk to and can relate to. That is a helper made suitable. Jesus is now going, oh, I have someone to, to do my Father's will with. That, that, uh, that word, a helper, suitable, means one that stands in front of. And Jesus go, I have someone face to face. This is who we are. This is our identity. From the very beginning, we are created in his image, which means we can love. We can love. This is what he's given man. This is what he's given humanity, is the ability to love. On page two. So the father gave us this ability to love. Why? Because he wanted his son to experience a bride who loved him. You're like, oh, so how many of you, when you, you know, whether you're married or you're single, you have family, what have you, but when you do acts of love towards someone, you want to be loved back. Who wants to be loved back? Okay, whoever's hand's not raised is lying. <laughs> Right, because we were made for love. We were made to give and receive love. But the thing is, the, the whole definition of love, if it's forced, it's not love. So if God made us robots, you know, because you always hear that argument, well, why did God make Adam sin? Why didn't he just program him? Because he wanted to love us. You cannot love if you don't have a choice. Love is voluntary. That we sang the song, you know, what, uh, I don't even remember the words, but um, just tell me what moves you. And Jesus is like, the reason I love you is because you're the only one that has your voice. And you're the only one that can speak your heart to my heart. And I can't force you to say it. And no one else can force you to say it. But you say it, Jesus. I love you. He goes, I love you. Because that's my desire. Because Jesus was like, oh, that's all I wanted to hear. Because that, that act of saying that is voluntary. It act as voluntary. This is who we are as humanity. This is what the enemy has lied to us about, right? He, he goes, oh, no. I mean, we have all these phrases. If it feels good, do it, right? What is love? Oh, well, if you love is whatever you feel. I mean, that's what we're told. We're told that lust is love. That's what we're told. I mean, you guys don't even understand because you've grown up in it. And so the I idea of lust is take. So we've, we've now learned, oh, love must mean take. Okay, lust goes, what can I get from you? And the enemy goes, oh, well, that's what love is. That's what love is. Just take, take, take. What can you get? Make sure you're satisfied. Make sure you get everything you want. And, and, and we've been lied to, and we've been told that this is love. And, and, and Jesus comes, and he goes, oh, now you want to know what love is? He goes, go to a wonderful cross. He said, this is love in a manifest. That Christ died for you. Love is sacrifice. 
I'm here to tell you that God is on your team. God will not abuse you. God will not use you. God is not looking to fulfill some grandiose scheme in his cosmic plan. And you just will happen to fit in there, so let me use you. This is love. For this was love made manifest. How could God the Father, who we cannot see, show us love? That God sent his son to die on the cross. I mean, we can visually see crosses all over the place, right? Visibly. He said, this is love. And the Father gives us a promise. And this is the promise he gave us. He spoke it in Deuteronomy. He spoke it again in Matthew. He goes, oh, my bride, for my son that I'm preparing, here's a promise for us. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And at first you go, wait a minute. Why is that a promise? I thought that's the first commandment. And the commandment means I have to do it. See, again, the enemies lied to us. No, the Lord goes, I commanded it. It's my voice that spoke it. This is your identity. This is your promise when the enemy comes in like a flood, when the enemy comes and condemns your heart. He said, you can stand on this truth. No, I will love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the enemy goes, well, yeah, but I know what you really And he goes and he picks at you and he knocks your identity. And the father goes, whose voice are you going to believe? Are you going to come over to my authority? Because I say, you love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is God's command. And his second commandment, he goes, the second is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Is it going to take faith? I'm going to love you like I love myself, right? He goes, but look, it's not by your strength and it's not by your might. It's by the command of the word of the Lord that I speak over you. His word is living and active. This, this uh, burden that the enemy has put over the people of God of, oh, you got to love God, you got to love God. You gotta. Love is voluntary. You do not have to love God. That is a choice that the Father made himself so vulnerable in. He goes, I'm going to make myself so vulnerable. Jesus goes, I'm going to lay naked before the world with my heart exposed. I'm going to make myself the most vulnerable to my creation because I'm going to let them choose what to do with my broken body and my poured out blood. I'm going to let them choose. Are they going to be the ones that mock me? And spit in my face. The very ones that I knit together in their mother's womb. Are they going to grow up and curse me? Am I going to be the drunkard's song? I mean, did you ever wonder why people don't use Muhammad's name in vain and Buddha's name in vain? But why Jesus? Why God? Because I created you. And I'm giving you a choice you love me because if I don't give you the choice it's not love if I don't give you the choice it's not love and our father who's gracious and compassionate and slow to anger doesn't hate you he goes I'll let you choose you can choose life you can choose death you can choose the blood of the sacrifice of my son the wondrous cross, you can lay your life down to receive a newness of life. Or you can go your own way and harden your heart. It's your choice. He does not force himself on any of us. He gives us a choice. He gives us a choice. And so as this bride of Christ, I, 
you know, some of you may like a bride, especially you guys, like, I'm not looking to be a bride. <laughs> like, you know. But guess what? We're sons <laughs> of God. We're soldiers, right? Women, we're soldiers. Guys, we're brides. And you know what the bride, you know why? Because, and this is, this is a uniqueness um, in this generation. Because, again, I want you to really grasp this concept that whatever God loves, the enemy hates. So way back in Genesis 1-1, when, when God created them male and female, what did the enemy hate? Gender. Okay? When God decreed male, female, the enemy goes, no. He's rebellious. He's a liar from the beginning. Okay? He came in, it's not just in this generation. It's been in societies of past. He's come against this. He's come against the gender and said, eh, no, let's confuse it all. It's really simple, guys. It's very simple, male, female. Okay, the enemy makes it. And then the next thing you know, you have 13 different things to pick from. No, male, female. The second thing, yeah, amen, right? It's easy, right? A, a preschooler can fill it out. Okay, and the second thing is, he now declares marriage to one, male, female, husband, wife. The two shall become one in a unity of marriage, a covenant. And it's in this covenant that this is where the bridal paradigm comes in. God gives us a picture so he wants us to understand. No, you're in covenant with me. This is the bridal paradigm. You have a father and a mother, but I'll tell you that relationship between a husband and wife is way different. I'm in covenant with my husband, which means our hearts, our affections have become one. And this is, this is the other beauty of, of marriage. I, oh, I can't remember who said I think it was somebody in our, in our uh, base there. But the biggest yes that you say on that day that I do, do you take this man? And you say yes. All you're focusing on is the yes in the one person. Like, I never, ever considered all the other names out there, i.e., well, if you say yes to him, then that means you're saying no to Albert, Fred, Johnny, freaking, blah, blah, blah. like, to whatever, how many people are in the world, and take that by half, two billion people you're saying no to. Like, that thought did not cross my mind when I'm standing there making a covenant with my husband. The only thought that stayed in my mind is, yes, I do. I want this one. And that's the covenant that we enter in with Jesus. We go, yes, I want this man. And he goes, oh, I want you. And it's a covenant of affection from everlasting to everlasting. The problem is, as soon as we mention the word marriage, emotions come up in our hearts because the enemy has distorted marriage. See, we no longer have a beautiful picture of marriage that lasts forever. No, we have brokenness. We have divorce. We have remarriage. We have step families. We have this. We have this. And all of a sudden, marriage becomes like, well, what's the big deal of marriage? So now let's just sleep together before we even get married. And you have immorality is rampant and all these things. And all of that is a distortion because God said, a man shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. And the battle began. And the enemy said, I hate you. I hate it. And he's attacked it ever since. And so in your generation, when the spirit and the bride say, come, and, and we, we start declaring, you're a bridal generation. God's coming back for a bride who's going to be wholehearted. It stirs up emotions inside of you and go, yeah, well, my dad left me alone. So what's the big deal about a covenant? Do you, do you see what the enemy's tried to do to a generation? He's taken the sacredness out of it. But I'll tell you what, God restores hearts. And he's going, oh, no, 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 no. We are in covenant. And he goes, and my covenant is with my love. My love never fails. I'm in covenant with my church. So much so, when he went into Ephesians, he goes, I laid my life down for you. Because we are the beloved of Jesus. 
when we, when we sang that song, the darling of heaven crucified. Did you know that when he was crucified and he rose again and he purchased for his father a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, and he goes, Father, I did according to your will. Here's many sons and daughters for you. And he says, oh, son, I have a reward. I have a reward for your suffering son. And what kind of, I mean, here's the father going, you are my precious son in whom I'm well pleased. He's only going to give him the best of the best of the best. And guess what? It's us. He's like, oh, son, I'm preparing a bride for you, pure and spotless. And you're going to be in covenant. So when we think of the bride of Christ, especially for you guys, the bride of Christ, it means his heart is for you forever. Forever. He looks at you and goes, well pleased. And it says in Romans that nothing can separate you from the love of God. No angels, no demons, no deception, no deceit. The powers of hell cannot come and render that covenant null and void. And God says in his scripture, I hate divorce. Now, when God hates something, he hates it. Why? Because he goes, I'll never be divorced. I'll never be divorced. I hate divorce. And he linked to us forever. This is the hepsibah. My delight is in you. This is the victory of the bride, is that we are not going to stay stuck in sin. That we have a bridegroom, the son of man, that purchased us, bought for us with his own blood. And that he's given us a choice. He's given us this gift of freedom. He's given us this gift. And Jesus has a desire, so we, we, we see Jesus' desire for this. Listen, I want you to just close your eyes for a minute and just listen to these verses that Jesus speaks. He's praying to his father. This is right before the cross, the hour of his intense suffering. And Jesus goes to the father. He said, Father, I desire This is the son of man, the son of God, the uncreated one. And he has a desire in his heart. He says, I desire that they whom you've given me be with me. Father, I want them with me where I am. I'm willing to give my life for my bride so that she can be with me where I am. I'm willing to break the power of darkness, of sin and death with my very life. So she will be with me where I am. He's pleading, he's like, Father, I desire. He speaks to his disciples and he goes, if I go, he's coming to the cross and prepare a place for you. Oh, I'm going to come again. I'm going to come again, my bride, and I'm going to receive you to myself. I'm going to draw you near to my heart, bride, and that where I am, there you may be also. Do you remember from last night where he is? Before the Father's throne, receiving all the kingdom and dominion and authority? I'm not just going to come down like I did the first time. I'm going to bring you where I am. And I'm seated at the right hand of my father. Because I want you to be with me where I am. In Revelations, it says, if you overcome, that I'm going to give you the throne. And you will sit with me in my throne. I'm going to give you authority to rule nations. Nations. Do you see why the enemy wants to block this? Because not only are you going to rule nations, you know what you're going to do to all the works of the enemy? Jesus says, you can trample me underfoot. I've given you authority over every scorpion to trample underfoot. He said, the power of darkness has no hold on you. 
I've broken it, and I've given you authority over demons and over sickness and over disease. Do you see why the enemy attacks you relentlessly? He goes, if they know the authority that they have, I have no chance. So he blinds our eyes and keeps a veil so that we come before this mean, stoic, aloof God that we're not quite sure even likes us. As he's calling from heaven, my delight is in you. And the enemy lies and goes, he doesn't like you. He's boring. You know that Christian life? It's boring. Why do you want this? Look, I have pleasures for you. I can stimulate your flesh. See, the enemy comes and he stimulates our flesh. He goes, you want love? I can give you love. But it doesn't satisfy you. Oh, the moment. And then you go to sleep. And you're alone in your bed again. And you're unrest. So you wait for the next thrill. And then the enemy goes, hey, you don't like to be told what to do, do you? Well, if you choose my side, you can control your whole life. You can do whatever you want. But see, you become conservative. Why do you think of God's addictions? We're an addicted world because we bought the lie that I'm really content where I'm at. And when we have before us a Savior that stands there, And he's not going, come, so I can control your life. That's not what Jesus offers. He goes, you want love? Because I come and take it from you. You can give me your love. It's your choice. It's your choice. And Jesus speaks this to his disciples when he's with them and they're They're trying to, I mean, those disciples are always trying to figure out Jesus because he's always breaking their boxes. And and Jesus makes this statement, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, you know. And and I grew up in a very uh, rigid church, and and I took that verse as like, okay, if you love me, you'll obey me. So I'm like, I've got to obey because Jesus, I love you, but oh, I got to obey though. I got to obey. What do you want me to do? You got to do all the, dot all your I's, cross all your T's, make sure all the outside looks great. And you get in a frenzy and you get to striving. And for some people, they'll go, eh, I don't even care. I'll just do whatever I want. And the other person's like in striving mode. Okay, I got to obey. I got to obey. I got to obey. And the enemy relentlessly beats, you got to obey. You got to obey. You messed up. You must not really love him. You're like, I do, I do, I do. I think I do. Okay, I'll try harder. And we make all these bargains with the Lord. Oh, next time, next time. I'm going to stop next time. (laughs) I'm not going to fall into that sin again. And try to get it. And it's like Jesus one, one day comes and he goes, shh, 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 shh. I'm going to speak with you. And you love me. You'll obey me. And he changed the nuance around. And he says, if you love me, your obedience will follow. And he spoke so clearly to me. He goes, when you are in a wrestle, for obedience. He goes, you don't need to try harder. You need a greater revelation. Because if you see a deeper revelation of my love, you'll give your life to me. And it changed the trajectory of my Christian walk in this sense. Instead of going to a father, a God that I was trying to always appease, that I always fell short of, all of a sudden I came to a loving father that says, God, I'm in a wrestle again. There's this thing that I don't want to give up. I do, but I don't. Show me your love, God, again. I need a deeper revelation of your love. And no longer was I focusing on the sin and what to say no to, but I focused on the yes, I want this man. So I didn't think of all the things I was saying no to. He's just the one. And he loves the answer, the prayer taking you deeper. And when you're stuck, I mean, this, like, uh, I know, like, this, uh, in this sense, what the enemy has done to this generation, when I see it, it breaks my heart. I mean, you guys all know TikTok, right? Well, I mean, I expose myself. I didn't really know what TikTok was. So I found out what TikTok was about a couple weeks ago. So 
old man. I started weeping. I started weeping because I saw all these girls dressed provocatively, kind of dancing, doing these little things, thinking this is what I need to do to get love. A generation grown up under the lie of the enemy that has told girls that you're no better than a lust object for men, that this is your identity. And I started weeping over a generation. I said, oh God, if you don't break through, if you don't break through, and then I keep scrolling, and I hear the mouths of the men. They just curse. They're using the F word like crazy, the way they talk to girls. And I started weeping, and I said, oh, God, the enemy has stripped the men of their manhood. They have said they're animals, and whatever your instinct is, do it, because that's what animals do. But I tell you, men, God has created you with the strength on the inside to say no to your flesh. This is the glory of manhood is that you would uphold the weak. And I just started weeping over a generation stuck with the lies of the enemy that says, girls, if you want to get love, give your bodies away. And guys, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter anyway. And it's stripped you guys of manhood and femininity. And thus there's all this confusion. And I was weeping over a generation. I said, oh my God. God, this is what they're spending time on. This is what's coming in, and this is the lies that is penetrating their heart. I said, no wonder they're so wounded and empty inside. They think they're so strong, but the enemy has stripped you guys bare. He's made you less than the image of God. And I want to stand here today over a generation. I say, women, that is not love. It is not love. You were created in the image of God. You were created to be a a helper suitable, which means you were created to show forth the dignity of the bride of Christ. Us as women, we can show forth the beauty and majesty of a queen clothed in righteousness, walking with dignity and honor. And men, oh men, you were created with such a strength that you don't understand how you can speak forth an identity into a woman's heart and call her forth. You can help the weak and the broken because you're strong. You do not have to give yourself away to every passion that comes your way. And the speech that comes forth from your mouths where you're cursing each other left and right. It ought not to be. We should be building each other up, not tearing each other down. I said, and you are life changers right here. All of you who's hearing this message, you do not have to give in to the lie of the enemy. You can choose this day to receive who you are in Christ. You are created in the image of God. You are male and you are female. And you were created for him, by him. This is who you are. This is who you are. You are Hephzibah. His delight is over you. It doesn't matter your past. This day can be your marking point. Jesus says, no, I will wash you. It's clean. 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 And I can restore identity back into you. I can speak back your manhood. I can speak back your femininity. Because I am the living God. I created you in your mother's womb. I know why you're here. If you want to know why you're here, claim it. Stop going to the world. The devil who's a liar who will only feed you temporary pleasures and then leave you broken. On the inside, on the outside, he breaks you. He uses you to break your friends. And then you're all a broken mess, and you don't know what to do to get out of your brokenness, so you just stay in your brokenness. 
Lord's like, oh, I have a better answer. It's called the cross. It's called the cross. And we have a choice. Let's, let's stand as the worship team or whoever's doing it. As I end here. See the beauty of the cross. Isn't just that he died for sinners so that somehow we would stand and God would say, see, I'm the righteous God. You sinners repented. Thank you. He goes, oh, no. The beauty of the cross is now that our hearts can be connected. I didn't just die to have robots. He goes, I died for the affection of your heart. And where have we been giving our affections? Where, men, have you been given your strength to? Is it to video games, hours upon hours and endless hours on video games? Is that where your strength goes? Is that where your mental strength lies? In pornography, thinking somehow you'll find intimacy, you'll find a fulfillment for this loneness, that it was not good for the man to be alone. It will never satisfy you. It's a false intimacy. Jesus and him alone can only fill that void that's deep inside of you. Girls, the same for you. You do not have to give your bodies away for love. That is not love. Any man that demands it is not love. You have a father in heaven who calls you his daughter, who covers you and has clothed you with dignity. And you have a savior, Jesus. Who will not use you or abuse you. And you can shine forth the dignity of Christ. You can show before your brothers, no, that's not who I am. It's the bride of Christ. This is not who I am. This is not who I am. The drugs, the alcohol, it won't take away the pain. It anesthetizes, but it won't take away the cutting. It won't take away the pain. Suicide won't end it. It will not. But there is a Savior. There is a Lamb whose blood is flowing. And He can take not just our sin away, but He comes to forgive you. All the pain, all the rejection, all the hurt, the abuse. He doesn't just take your sins. He takes the sins that were done to you. He said, that abuse wasn't okay. I died for that. I felt the pain of it. And Jesus felt the pain on the cross. He feels pain. We can grieve his heart. So let's just open ourselves up and... I really feel that there, there is a choice. You do not have to choose Jesus. You do not have to choose him. But in choosing, in saying yes to Jesus, he says, well, you must then 